So uh, here we are in the studio and I'm hoping to show a few of the next stages in what I normally regard as my production process. Um, my first uh, operation of the day is to uh, uncover the, the, uh, the paint trolley and um, I start by watering my my paints. It's like you know, keeping a a few plants in the greenhouse. You know, you need to keep everything nice and steady in its temperature and fluid state. There we go. Uh, and as well as these, I've, I've got uh, a number of, of, um, of old um, film cassettes full with washes which are already made up. I know that the colours that I'm going to be using. Um, so the, the, as, uh, as I go along, I'm not having to spend a lot of time uh, pre preparing those and indeed on occasions let's, let's say I might have a morning working on skies or, or something like that. Um, now uh, I've already broken the sort of traditional watercolorist rule which is, which is to um, uh, paint first and draw afterwards uh, because the fear is that if you do what, what we what you see here and make a careful drawing um, and then paint that that somehow inhibits the brush and uh, inhibition is not what uh, I'm known for so uh, I carry on regardless and actually uh, although this is a, a, a fairly complicated drawing and I can Show that to the camera. Um, uh, it's a quite a detailed drawing, but quite a lot of that will disappear under the paint. But I know it's there and it helps me as I go along. So it's the, the drawing prompts me and reminds me uh, as we proceed. Uh, now some of the some of the colours are uh, much more likely to go into solution than others. Uh, so I avoid putting greens uh, on the page at an early stage in the process because if I wet over the top of them you'll have green everywhere again. Um, so greens are among the last colours which I apply. Um, uh, earth colours are amongst the most stable uh, in terms of their uh, longevity, but the uh, if, you, if you're wanting to uh, put uh, an order on how how I put the, the paint on the paper, and I know that it's not going to they're not going to upset each other. The first thing I do is look to the sky, and I think as it's such a nice day today, I'll um, start with a blue sky. Um, so this is a mixture of, of, of colours using a big fat flat brush and I'm right handed so I generally start over in the right hand corner so you see most of the, the detailed drawing gets in the right hand corner as well and the paint's following the same line so uh, what what uh, Edward Wesson or one of the great sort of traditional English watercolorists would would tell you is that um, the um, the first colours are the soft washes and as you progress you f finish up with the finer and finer detail. Um, well, I intend to show that I don't always follow the rules like that I'm afraid. Um, so as far as 
uh, anybody w look, w watching this goes trying to work out how to do it themselves, my response is um, don't do what I'm doing. Um, work it out for yourself. If you if you want to get a perfectly good result, then follow Mr. Wesson's work in on video or or um, you know, there are plenty of plenty of how to paint a watercolor videos or or instruction manuals available. Use one of those. Um, but the best of all is to find out what works for you. Now I. Um, I suppose, regard as it's, it's my training that I I find uh, the drawing the most exacting part of making any image. So the paintwork is a sort of uh, relaxation from that, uh, and it's sort of it's almost. A, almost a completely different activity. It's a weird, weird thing. Um, and some things work better as drawings um, and some as paintings. I know quite often I get asked whether uh, I shouldn't try and just sell drawings, but we live in a world where People expect coloured images, brightly coloured image, images, um, and um, I, although I've, I have tried it from time to time, I, in the end I've come to the conclusion that if you're going to try and do what I do, which is make a living from selling paintings, you have to offer what you what you're customers want to some degree and still stretch them if you can uh, you know because it's uh, the, the point about what I'm doing is to try and draw people into the process of looking enjoying their surroundings noticing things and and uh, forming their own opinions about about things. I mean, we've all learned to appreciate sunsets or whatever, usually aided by something in the way of a liquid refreshment in my case, but um, it's it's finding more in in uh, in it than than that and it, it it's ed a question of of educating the eye. So, uh, what I'm trying to do now is, or I'm going to try and do, is start to replicate what I have in my head about seeing this image. I, I don't think I've mentioned what it is. It's, it's a scene in the centre of Bruges. drawing I made on a recent expedition and has been sitting waiting for me to get to this stage for a little while. But now I'm removed from the subject and, and in a sense uh, that's, that helps relax me because I don't have the worry of trying to reproduce what I'm seeing in front of me. What I'm trying to do now is investigate what's in my head and put it on paper uh, and be prepared to let some things happen of their own accord. Um, I haven't quite mixed up this uh, pot of, of colour before I started on this and so I'm getting some different differentials in this and there's a thing in um, watercolour painting called wet into wet, which I don't think it needs much explanation, but it means you, with skies for instance you can get some nice st soft sort of cloud effects and that's what I'm trying to, to produce here now. Um, 
and just some touches of, of it down here. This, this is one of the canals right in the centre of Bruges. And by the time I got to that corner, it was time to stop for lunch. So you remember things. It's cu curious. You, you remember, I quite often listen to to the radio or to music or whatever and, and the curious thing is that as you work on the image again even if it's some time later as it is in this case it, it evokes the, the whatever was happening when you were there which is, which is what, I'm, what I'm trying to do I'm trying to put my head back to the experience of of being there and why I chose to depict this in the first place and for the moment I am going to leave that and let it dry off um, uh, the those who, who know about these things will notice that um, I haven't stretched the paper and it's again something that uh, uh, I'm uh, doing in the wrong order as far as the rule book is concerned. I tend to stretch these, as you can probably see from the from the board behind, I tend to stretch these after I've painted them, not not before. That's partly because I don't want to be carrying a, a, a great piece of, of um, extra board with me when I go out into the in, uh, on my expeditions. Um, as you might be able to see, there are a number of other uh, drawings which which I've just got out, um, and they sh they show uh, uh, that if I had to have all of those on a stretched board to go out um, on an expedition to the continent, I would have uh, a, a little bit of extra. Uh, money to pay for um, excess baggage, I suspect. So, I'm proposing to leave that now, and I'm going to um, start again with another uh, watercolour, which I've uh, taken to the next stage in production. The, uh, the f there's something I should just discuss before I go on with this is the materials which I'm using. Uh, we talked about the, the paper and, and that. The, uh, now with the paints, um, as with the paper, I always tell people whatever uh, level of achievement they've reached to use the best quality materials uh, that are available to them because you never know when you're going to produce a masterpiece. We, for a third of a century, we ran our own gallery, but we also offered a framing service. And I've seen masterpieces come in for framing on the backs of pieces of wallpaper and all sorts of things, and you know, and painted with poster paints, and you know that they're not going to last. So um, my uh, advice to anybody, if they're trying anything at all, is use materials that are um, going to have the best chance of, of uh, surviving. The quality of paint uh, makes a difference to the way it behaves. The better paints tend to be finer ground and um, behave differently to, to the cheaper ones. So there's no point in getting thinking that you're going to be able to learn how to paint with poor quality materials and then when you really got good at it then you start graduating to the good stuff because then you've got to relearn it all again because the paints are not going to behave as you expected them to. So here we go with, uh, you'll see that, that um, uh, this is one I've uh, got a little bit further on and uh, already applied some uh, washes and I'm just going to move on to the next next stage which again is going to be uh, broad wash um, no, it doesn't always work like this sometimes 
sometimes I uh, annoy the purists by um, painting detail first and putting washes over the top of them and we may yet end up doing that with this this drawing um, uh, might, I might let's just see let's, let's do that um, see there's a sort of random element to, to the production of any any work like this you just have to go with what, what happens um, sometimes it's it's what happens while you're working um, if you're out in the field uh, you know, something, some event takes place or um, there's a change in the light or whatever um, sometimes you just want to just, just uh, um, I'm just sharpening up a Okay, I don't think it's the colour I want, actually. Uh, now, let me scrabble in my... ...array of... Uh, I'm going to try and find a watercolour pencil. That's to show that you don't have to paint with liquid paint. Um, I'm looking for a sort of light terracotta. As you can see, I've got more than more than just the one. That is that looks better. I'll sharpen that one up. Um, these are this is just the same watercolour that you would get in a block. I tend to use two watercolour. I, I, I favour Winston Newton, but other other manufacturers are available. Um, and uh, uh, this is the this is the equivalent of just the stuff that's straight out of the uh, out of the block. Um, but now this is uh, this uh, picture is of um, Stratford upon Avon. And the festival theatre, and and um, it had a makeover recently. And it's got an interesting uh, new look to the to the um, to the main theatre building, and uh, what I'm doing here is just drawing the effect of brick coursing over the top of the terracotta wash that I've already put on there. What I'm trying to do is to create the effect that you get, a slightly, a slightly dappled effect of, of the brick, which is quite a light coloured brick, my recollection of, of this. Um, particular building. Um, I'm asked quite often, and sometimes I would at this stage resort to having a look and seeing if I can find some photographs, because uh, I do take a camera with me on expeditions, not not generally to to generate the images in the first place, because I'm there to do the drawing on site, but. Um, uh, as an aid memoir, um, but uh, I avoid it if I can because at this stage in the process, what I'm trying to do is open my memory and and let my recollection of the place give a truer truer picture of its its effect on me. Um, I mean, if you want a photographic re uh, reproduction of the way that the place looks, well, there's an obvious way to do that. Um, it becomes a bit more complicated when you've got o over here, you've got um, on this side, you've, you've got um, buildings which may or may not be brick, so I might have yet to to refer back. Sometimes I, I see I've not been 
very assiduous about taking notes on this occasion. Sometimes I just scribble little notes in the margin just to remind me. I'm thinking now, I'll use a, a, another big brush. Um, and uh, I'm just going to put another, another wash right over, right over the whole lot, I think. Um, and there's plenty of, of activity in this this square in front of me, but I, I'm going to leave fine detail to a much later stage in producing this painting. see that I, I have um, skipped very lightly over the areas which I've drawn with the, with the watercolour pencil because I don't want to undo it completely I and mean, if I scrub at it with the brush now all that will happen is all those little bits of marks that I uh, used to, to create the uh, the brick effect have all just gone into the wash, so to speak. Um, oh, it's falling off my paintbrush. Um, as an architect, I did learn as a student to how to put on washes, and this is not how to do it actually. Um, what if you want a nice even wash? which I'm not looking for here, but if you want a nice even wash, you're supposed to, to um, raise the board up slightly so that, so that you've always got a wet edge, so you don't get the, the uh, hardening of the, of the paint at the, at the edges and you just continue to work work down and let that gravity keep keep the edge wet and it gives you a, a nice even thing but I, what I'm trying to do is just the opposite really is get a nice sort of bit of variety into this because this this scene in front of me is full of activity and uh, so I don't I don't really want it to be all very, very calm, apart from this little bit of water. There's a bridge there. Oh dear, that's a, that's a calamity. There we are. You see, this is, this is what happens when you. Even if you get almost all the paint off, it still looks differently when you when you paint something and take the paint off than it does if you never put the paint there in the first place or put it on very thinly. Uh, I can't quite explain why that happens, but it is the case. So you just have to run with the effects that get created in front of you and if you don't like them you just undo them as you go along. Um, of course one of the things with watercolour is it has a horrible way of drying so um, you then sometimes you have this marvellous effect that you've created and watch it completely disappear in front of your eyes. But there are ways around that sometimes. Uh, sometimes you can add things like gum arabic into the into the uh, mix, which which uh, will keep the uh, as wet colour. 
before, of course, you just carry on adding more paint, which is what the traditional watercolours would tell you to do. Uh, here we go. Um, starting to to develop this. And getting to a stage where I'm probably going to leave this one. So I might give a little bit of uh, have a little bit of fun with some of the other techniques. I'll, I'll finish up with this bit down here. Sometimes it's interesting to to play around with sort of roll reversal. These uh, bollards in the front of course are, as these things usually are, are black. And having a couple of great big black bollards, bollards in the, in the uh, foreground may be a bit distracting. So if you put them in in white, you're having the same, or don't paint them or whatever, you're, you've got the same impact. But you don't have, you know, black is a very, a very, it's, it's a very, it's very strong uh, in terms of its effects. Uh, so the advice I have is use it rather sparingly. Uh, some people say that black doesn't exist as a colour, which is nonsense. Of course, we all know black is all the colours. But then so is white, all the colours, if you're talking about light. Um, what I was going to show, I think we can dispense with the, the tilt of the board now, so you can see that better. Um, but what, I, what I'm going to, to do now is um, start a bit of random surface. Uh, it's not the toothbrush that I used this morning, I have to tell you. Um, this is, this is uh, nevertheless a standard toothbrush straight out of the bathroom. And I don't want to overload it because that all you get is just great big drips. What I want to get is a splatter effect, so there we go. to give you a mottled, mottled finish uh, for those, those trees, you then go wash your hands. And I think I'm just going to just blot that around there a little bit. Some of the little spots of paint are quite fun uh, and some of them end up turning into birds. If you ever looked at the watercolours of David Cox, he, he, uh, he used to use sugar paper, which, which um, uh, was all he could afford, um, and uh, it, it tended to have little impurities, little specks, black specks in them, so he, he always used to turn those into birds, which I always look for now in his work, you know, knowing that. Um, right, so uh, that is uh, another st stage completed, and until those washes are truly dry, I'm going to leave that and we'll have a look at a another one which is already ready to go a little bit further. Uh, one which is which uh, I've worked up a little bit more. Um, it's uh, an image which which you may be familiar with. Uh, is it's a church in Kidderminster, St Mary's Church. No. Yes, St Mary's Church in Kidderminster, um, which is a very 
very obvious if you, as I do from time to time, drive through the place or round it. Um, and uh, you know, apart, apart from a magnificent piece of, of, of Gothic architecture, um, it's got an interesting situation above the canal and um, on the day that I was there um, also sharp rain showers meant that there was a rainbow but, but um, it's I don't know, rainbows are difficult difficult uh, things to include in a work because they they um, they tend to be too bright uh, and too distracting maybe um, so maybe we'll just have a very faint rainbow in this and um, I'm going to be using uh, watercolour pencils again to try and get that effect of the glow of a of a rainbow, even a faint one. Um, should have got my rainbow colours in order, shouldn't I, before I started talk talking, so that would have made made it easier for me. see the sort of state that my brushes end up uh, because I tend to abuse them so terribly this one has been scrubbed far too much and doesn't come to a point or anything um, I end up using house house paints and brushes Show the, the really, the really extraordinary effect of a uh, building like this. Uh, light it was quite, it was actually quite dark stone, but against the against the uh, cloud which has passed, uh, rather dark um, sky, dramatic sky, which is reflected in this water down here. And a uh, very light uh, tone on the tops of the, the trees as the light catches that as well. Uh, I don't think I'm getting the darkness I want into the, into the trees, into the skies at the moment. Um, that's a bit more like it. Interesting, uh, an interesting silhouette which I I will return to at a later stage and paint in the, the fine detail because there's some rather nice fretted parapets and whatnot that should appear against this dark dark ground. That's it. It's starting to 
do what I want, I suppose it is. Um, now, uh, there's, there was also a great big cascade here coming through because there was somebody coming through the the lock and to try and get that effect. You might see that there's also paints that have already been mixed up on the palette here. I'm going to start using some of those. I don't want pure colour because lock gates aren't, unless they've just been installed, aren't pure colour. Um, I'm just having a little difficulty remembering which which bits are painted which ways. have just been opened so eventually we're going to get some brightness down here but instead of unpainting it I what I'm going to do is use body color uh, white gouache to, to create that lightness um, now I think that, that lock gate is like so to dry off a little bit and I'm just going to start putting some drawn detail using watercolour pencils again drawn details into the uh, foliage here um, I have no particular recollection of what these trees are so it's going to be sort of generic foliage trying to do get this effect of a light top so that there's not too much con uh, contrast to the church behind. I want that all to be in more or less the same band of, of tone across the middle of the picture. Um, there's a thing called aerial perspective. Uh, now I think probably people probably know what um, uh, uh, the rules of perspective are, which are broadly that things get smaller as they get more distant. Well, aerial perspective, you just want to generalise a little bit, aerial perspective uh, is about the colour and tone uh, as opposed to the size um, and uh, things that are uh, lighter, brighter and yellower, redder uh, tend to be seen as perceived as being closer and things that are bluer, more distant. Um, and just um, When you describe it like that it just sounds so obvious but it's, it's it took quite a long time for people to work out how to how to depict distance um, and in a scene like this uh, of course you've got a highly dramatic uh, extra contrast um, but what I'm wanting to do is to get the effect of 
the sparkle in these in these trees. I won't have time now to to show it all, but I think you can see the way I'm going with this. Put it on, rub it off. to finish the effect. Um, so I'm happy with it over there, so I'll just get a bit of a I think you'll be able to see from looking at my palette that uh, there's generally a, quite a lot of things on the go. That's getting better there now. But my usual rule is mess about with it until it starts to look how you want it and then then try and have the discipline to leave it alone. I don't always follow my own rules, I have to, I have to say. But for the moment I think I'm going to leave that as it is. What what uh, the, the intention is? I don't, I don't really. I, I try not to have too many absolute goals in mind. But the the, the intention generally with with making the images is that because I first caught sight of it, this very contrasted sky uh, and and lighting and uh, so that's what I'm going to be working towards so all of this in the foreground the lock and whatnot it will be treated very loosely um, because I, 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 I if there's any fine detail at all it would be on uh, in depicting the, the uh, all the fine uh, uh, gothic stuff on the on the face of the church and any activity o over over here I, I uh, see I, there were a couple of boats there's this boat here waiting to to come into the into the lock so I I'll probably take the opportunity as uh, the narrow boats are interesting things artistically because they they can have some nice bright colors on them so that's a good a good spot to to um, draw the eye right in the, right in the middle of the image. So right, actually, thought that I'd finished this image several times in the past and decided again more recently that I haven't. So here I am, just just adding adding touches, and I'm I, what what's. Um, what I'm trying to do here is, um, sounds silly because uh, all I'm doing is adding in further detail, but actually what I'm trying to do is uh, to um, close, close down, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put a, a soft wash over the, the whole of the, the top of the painting and you can see at the, at the bottom, this is a view of the marketplace in Stone the Wold, by the way. Um, and I've kept, kept this deliberately, uh, um, I was going to say dim, uh, I don't want dim in my pictures, but, but um, uh, not, not uh, too um, uh, aggressive. And I'll try and quieten down the, the foliage above so that, so that you you're uh, going to uh, concentrate
concentrate on those light coloured buildings. Once again, uh, let's just try and work up those trees a bit, a bit further. Um, what I'm wanting to do actually is make contrast at the top and the bottom of the tree so the, the um, bits right under the edge there uh, I want to, to be quite, quite dark as just a suggestion of trunks no idea whether this is actually the case but there's no point in worrying about being too slavish about it because all I'm wanting to do is to get the general effect as I said the I can't honestly remember what what make of trees these were um, but what I'm trying to do Is, uh, the, uh, is, is uh, what I'm usually trying to do at this stage in the proceedings which is to try and increase the contrast um, as well as refine, refine the detail so as, as soon as you, you you can see that as soon as you start to do this it's it's it uh, hopefully is starting to give this part of the image some depth um, so we go along there and in this area here we've got a narrow boat which is waiting to come through the lock that's why the gates have been the sluice have been opened um, oh no it would have been the other way around I'm just trying to think they've opened opened the sluices so presumably oh no that's right this is the this is the first the first gate yes this is the first gate so they're filling the lock so they're waiting for this for this to happen so they can bring the Bring that boat through the through the gates. Of course they were, um, but it's it affords me the opportunity to use a little bit of bright colour right right in the middle of the image, which is where I want to do it. What may not have been apparent before is is the the figure here that uh, that um, is whoever it is operating the the sluice. have to think about how I want to portray them because I don't really want to make make it into a that they make it into too narrative a, a picture the sort of sort of thing uh, thing I got in mind was the sort of Frank Bran Bran Branwin effect a lot of uh, sheer oscuro of contrasting colours, the shadow in particular. And of course because the because the um, foliage is dark there, so is the reflection in the water of the canal and we just just need to sort of think about how I want to highlight that that uh, that narrow boat um, okay. if 
eventually I will be putting drawing in the uh, the rails uh, and other bits and pieces uh, which are uh, painted white. I'll be using white gouache to, to do that. Zinc white I use. The, you can get you can get permanent white, but permanent white if you start mixing it with other colours is is far too powerful. It will it will force its way migrate right through any any colour bleach in, anything out. So what you've got to look for is zinc white, which is what I use. Here we are, this stuff. And here we go. Uh, and what we will do is I will leave this shortly and we'll come back to it uh, when I've cooked it a bit more. But uh, I think you'll be able to see from this the direction of travel. Um, the other thing that I might do, uh, just to demonstrate another another thing that I do, this is a uh, uh, fine point, point uh, permanent black uh, pen and I intend to use, you've got to be fairly careful about how you use this because it, it is so so strong, I don't want to overdo it but as we're going to have this tower very light against the, the dark I'm hoping that that will be forgivable um, I will probably go over it a bit more and mitigate it a little, but I think you can see how this sharpens up the tracery in these windows. At this, at this stage I'm trying to up the contrast all round uh, to give the whole thing a little bit more uh, bounce. Uh, make the whole image a little bit, a bit more, more exciting. Um, I probably then, it's very likely, go over the whole lot again, dampening it down a little bit because I've probably overdone it. And it, it's it, the the process for me is, it's always a sort of gradual development. You think, oh no, this is working, and then you think, oh no. Uh, not so sure if it, if it really needed to be quite so uh, obvious as that or whatever. I think we might just put a couple of birds in while we're about it. Since we've got the pen on the go, there we go. Uh, and I'm going to leave that for the moment and we'll come back to it when those uh, that's had a bit of a chance to dry and I haven't... Oh no, what I, before I do, I'll just put some colour in on that um, lot, narrowboat. Sip of coffee, try and forget to. So, I'm wanting to... I have been known to put myself into paintings wearing a red top, but on this occasion, the red is going to be on the... of the boat. Uh, so it's all the way through, although these are all good, good quality materials, I'm doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, to try and get the, the thing about the pencils is they are that little bit more controllable and they're dry of course um, but they produce a grainy effect which is not always um, what you're really wanting to see uh, 
and I'm going to leave that as it is for the moment. 